Praise God. Now this meeting is to still our heart according to the mind and the will of God. So that we'll have the right perspective. Should be told, God is beginning to round off things on the earth. This earth that we have right now, God is rounding off what his program has been. So we are actually approaching the last days. We are in the last days. Even the last days have an end. The day when everything, like you know it presently, will be wiped out. And God will establish the new. And the new he will establish is that which has been in his heart. Praise God. And while I was praying about this, the Lord began to speak to me the role of men. And a lot the Spirit of God has exposed my heart to lately. And I thought it would be good to start speaking to the men directly. There are lots of informations that we put aside, but they are vital. I've always said this, that the purpose of the word of God coming to you, the purpose of God having relationship with you, giving you visions, is for you to make quality decisions. So whatever you're receiving from God, if it's not ending in the kind of decisions you make, then all the efforts are zero. As we grow, you'll, you'll see a lot of things. You'll see you know, different kinds of movements. We've had the faith movement. We've had different kinds of movements. We've had the prayer movements. And Recently, what's, uh, what's reigning among most young people is this prayer, uh, praying for long, stretch prayer. So you hear preachers who, who say, if you cannot pray five hours a day, you have not started. You hear, you hear them say those things. Now, yes, they are trying to inspire people to pray, which is good. But it doesn't mean that if you cannot pray up to five hours at a stretch, you are joking with your life. You see, such statements are statements you put in that Satan uses to begin to bring condemnation to the hearts of people. So the first thing you need to understand, okay, why do I pray? You need to understand that in the first place because people now walk around and say that I pray I pray this number of hours and they carry it as pride. Then you get to the next stage where people feel as long as I pray that long. You understand? It doesn't matter how I live my life. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So we have all this thing. Like you feel, I have set a target for myself to be praying five hours every day. And then they pray. Once they hit the target, they say, ah, I've hit the target. So you feel righteous. You feel fulfilled in your heart. But then you still don't understand the essence of praying. The essence of praying is that you will hear the voice of God. Even the faith movement, when the faith movement began, it's everything God starts. Satan just has a way of turning the whole thing around. The faith movement started. Now, the faith movement is supposed to aid our relationship with God. But the faith movement began to be faith for things. You understand? Faith for things. 
So I built this uh, church. We built this church by faith. And you see, it began to move in that direction. What you can do for God by faith in terms of works. Still, we miss the vital part, mostly, that is about the quality of life that you live. The quality of life that you live. From the faith movement, we moved into the seed sowing movement. Oh, sow your seed, sow seed, sow seed. And then we got to that point where, look, almost, just that we didn't say it, but the belief was almost like you can bribe God with your seed. Anything you want to have. So scriptures like money answered all things began to reign. Just, just sow seed, you know. There's a certain group of people that who even believe that it doesn't matter what sin you commit, just drop a seed on the altar and God will cover your sin. I heard those things from pastors' mouths. <laughs> Praise God. We still miss the vital thing, which is an enhancement of your relationship with God to improve your life. Whatever you, your dealings with God, if it doesn't in, improve the quality of decisions that you take, then it's a waste. And every day you make decisions that affect your life, that affect people's lives. Praise God. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Hallelujah. From verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now look at verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, number one, be fruitful. Number two, multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. After God made man, this is the assignment he gave to man. Number one, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth, subdue the earth. Like I've said before, when you hear the word subdue, it gives you an idea of a struggle. You understand? When you hear subdue, it gives you an idea of a of a struggle. You understand what I'm saying? Struggle for superiority or things like that. Now, so you find God, the first instruction he's giving man, he has not told man that there's an enemy. But then the first set of instruction he's giving to man, he added, subdue the earth. So God was already telling man that the earth, you're going to have a challenge with the earth. But I'm giving you the authority, an assignment to subdue it. Meaning, you have the ability to subdue the earth. Praise God. Now, I want us to look at these instructions that God gave to man. And this is from where we're going to build, build up from. And let me put this. He told man this after he created him. 
And this was the assignment man was carrying on. Because sometimes they say, why, why are you talking to the men only? Why not the women and the men? I, I keep, I've been getting on this. Why only men? Why? Okay, when are you going to have the one for women? I said, let's finish with the men. <laughs> Praise God. Even my mom called me today. I said, when are you going to have the one for them? I said, will you come for it? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Now, this was... The assignment he gave to man. That he looked at man and then he now said, it is not good for the man to be alone. There is something the man was doing that made God to look at him and said, he needs help. I'll make him a helpmate. Meaning the help that he needs is to help him do these things, assignments, that God has given to him. Now we read this thing all the time, but we've not taken time to really sit down and say, what is this assignment true? In these things are the whole assignment of a man's life. Be fruitful. Now here's the mistake. We see the word fruitful, and all we think about is producing children. That's all we think about. But that's not the meaning of what God said when he said, be fruitful. That wasn't the meaning. That was not what he was thinking about. Because the next thing he said after be fruitful is what? Multiply. He was not, it's not, it's not tautology. It's not like he was saying the same thing. So he's just emphasizing it. No. They are different things. And there's a reason the word be fruitful comes before multiply, multiplication. There must be something that you are multiplying. So he says first, be fruitful. Now what does it mean to be fruitful? It's simple. Be full of fruit. Now remember, God made man in whose image? In God's image. So he made man in his image. Then he said to him, be fruitful. So if you're going to be fruitful... You're going to produce fruit. Right? Now, when God says be fruitful, He was speaking in relationship with virtue. Have enough fruit. Be full of fruit. He was actually referring to godly virtues. Now, he made man in his image and after his likeness. But of course, man didn't wake up as his image. Are you getting what I'm saying? He started raising man. He started training man to grow up, to fully manifest his image and his likeness. But we know the story. Truth be told, Adam, this fruitfulness part, they missed it. They missed it because they didn't follow him long enough to understand his fruits. Are you following me? They didn't follow him enough to understand his fruits. This is the reason Jesus came afterwards and told his disciples, look, stay until you be endued with power from on high. And this is the reason Jesus kept telling them, look, you've got to receive the Holy Spirit. You've got to receive the Holy Spirit. And then, when they received the Holy Spirit, they began to do several things. But Jesus, before he left, kept emphasizing one thing. And what is that one thing he was emphasizing? He says, in John chapter 15, he kept emphasizing, you know, in John chapter 15, he talked about, I'm the vine, you are the branches, right? And then he began to talk about the branches producing fruit. You see, everything Jesus came to do, there is nothing he came to do that is new. Everything he came to do was to connect with the original plan that God had from the beginning. Now you get what I'm saying? So when Jesus came and said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you so that you will bear 
fruits. And so that your fruit will remain. He wasn't just saying, hmm, there's something new I want you to do. No. In the beginning, God told man what? Be fruitful. So, God was actually telling man, be a fruit. And when you study that John 15, the fruit he was talking about, you know, people say, oh, be a fruit, go and win souls. Do you understand? Go and win souls and bring them in. Go and win. How many souls have you won today? Oh, I won 10 souls today. Oh, wow. Praise God. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's not fruitfulness. That's actually multiplication. But what's the use of multiplying without bearing fruit? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you find in the New Testament, and Paul came up later and defined it properly. I said the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. See that in Galatians chapter 5, from verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, he began to list. Now notice he didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. He said the fruit of the Spirit. Even Jesus in John 15, study it, he didn't say bear fruits. He says bear fruits. Bear fruits. So from the beginning, when God was talking about being fruitful, he was not talking about in terms of number. He was talking about in terms of quality. Bear fruit. That's why I say it is virtue that he was talking about. So when Galatians tell us the fruit of the Spirit, you no know, people say there are, there are nine fruits of the Spirit. No, there are not nine fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> Praise God. There are not nine fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is one. It's one. And what is it? Love. Praise God. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Every other thing listed afterwards, they are not separate fruits. They are all describing what love is. I hear you. So when God said to man in the garden, be fruitful the command he was giving man is have so much love are you listening to me that's all the command he gave to man have so much love why because god is love that's the virtue that he has now he made man in his image what did he transfer to man love so he says be fruitful then he says multiply what is he supposed to multiply he is supposed to multiply that same of his kind but guess what happened they began to multiply without fruit they have been driven out of the garden being driven out of the garden disconnected them from the love of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? They were disconnected from the love. Oh, we have sinned. And now, now God is looking at us one kind. Hey, God, now say, guys, look, <laughs> please leave this garden. <laughs> go outside, go and till the ground. They were not tilling the ground to feed before. Everything they needed was supplied in that garden, which was a display of God's love for them. Now, that's how they were created. That's how they were created. That's what they came to see. That's what they were exhibiting. That's what they were receiving. But then they disobeyed God and God drove them out of the garden. Now, they start giving back to children when they have left the garden. They began their multiplication outside the place of love. Are you listening to me? So, that's where they began their multiplication. So, fruits was missing. But multiplication began. And that's where the wahala of man started from. The assignment was never understood. It was never being done as it was supposed to be done. But this is the thing God said to me. Be full of love. Be full of love. That's the fruit. 
be loveful be loveful then multiply and then he says the next thing he says fill up the earth that's the extent of your multiplication fill up the earth then he said subdue it how do you subdue the earth you subdue the earth with love you see because before god created man there was an enemy already on the earth i hope you know that lucifer was there already and by the time man was created lucifer have already started tampering with the issues of the earth that's why god destroyed it in the first place you know he was in charge of the whole earth right and he had scattered things and god destroyed everything i said i'm going to start again now god with this idea if you bear fruit by that fruit multiply fill up the whole earth so now the earth is going to be filled with people of fruit are you getting then because they are of fruit and this love is not a love that you generate from yourself it's a love that you receive from god which you generate And the idea God had, the idea he still has, is that the earth will be filled with people of love, people of his character. Now, so that when he communicates with us, the communication, the line of communication is clear. It's love. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's love. You know, naturally, when you don't trust someone's heart to you, even when the person is talking to you, your understanding of the person's words will be twisted. You know that. But when you trust the love of somebody, even when the person talks rashly to you, you say, ah, something must be wrong somewhere. <laughs> And the other one say, no, something must be wrong somewhere. Ah, no, let me, uh, let me give him space more. <laughs> then we'll go and continue our, <laughs> our thing. Let me, let me, maybe somebody offended him or somebody offended her. Because now nah, this is not this person. Or somebody that you're already looking at in one kind. Now since so I said it. <laughs> And I think this is a confirmation of that guy. Pack your load and leave this place. <laughs> this person is not on your side. Why? Because love is missing. Now, the person may have just acted innocently. And most times, you know how these things work. Most times, it's like two years later, five years later, you don't realize what happened that day. So, how you now wake up and realize that your thoughts were wrong but you have confessed the evil that is in your heart already now that's why the bible says, a fool if he keeps quiet he's thought to be wise <laughs> he's a fool though. but if he just keeps quiet people look at him and say I'm sure he doesn't want to say anything God, maybe ah, he knows too much. He doesn't just say <laughs> <a> wise guy. Because <laughs> when you talk too much, praise God. I'm saying that to say when there is no love, wrong interpretations come in. So someone can act innocently, just like in this case now. Someone acted innocently, not even thinking about you doing his thing to make money and somebody saw it interpreted what he wants to interpret and ran with it without calling i said this thing you did i don't like it what did i do how can you do this say, oh no that's not no nah, at all how <laughs> praise god 
So that's why God insisted. That's why God, the vision God had, be full of love. Be loveful. Multiply. Fill up the earth and subdue it. So Jesus came and said the same thing to us. The reason I chose you is for what? It's so that you will bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. Not that you will get tired of bearing fruits, but that your fruit that you bear will remain. You will be constant in love. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you this truth. The challenge, the only challenge that you face in life is the challenge of love. Every challenge that you will face in this life, everything that you will have to deal with in this life is one. It's one thing it is coming against. The thing Satan is coming against in your life is the same thing, love. From day one till the day you leave this earth, it is love battle that you are going to be fighting. That's why God says subdue the earth. When he says subdue the earth, he was referring to everything that will come against you on earth. You have received the authority to rule over it. Are you get what I'm saying? How do you rule over it? Because what is going to come against you is to tell you that the love is not enough. Are you get what I'm saying? That the love in you is not enough. That is what life is going to be telling you every day. That the love in you is not enough. When you don't have money, that's what it's telling you. If God loves you, do you understand? If God loves you, why? <laughs> look at you now. You don't even have money to go to where you're going to. You look at yourself. Ah, I have prayed now. <laughs> do you understand? I have prayed now. What is going on? That's the challenge. Everything you face when you fall sick is the same challenge that you are facing. Where is the love? Disappointment you face with people is the same question is asking. Where is the love? That, that's why the first thing God said is, be love what? Full, 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 full. That's the instruction he gave to man. This is before even the woman came. Now, that's why Paul teaching in, in, in Ephesians chapter 5 says, husband, do what? Love your wife. It's a ministry. And it has nothing to do with how she behaves. Say, Kai, I know the Bible says I should love my wife, but my wife, eh? Chai! Eh, eh! You don't understand. You think she is the problem. You don't know that you are the focus of the attack. You are being attacked. What are you? What is the attack? That you do not bear fruit. So now you look at yourself, I can't love my wife again, no? Why? If you know what she has done, you don't know that you have demoted yourself. You are actually saying, I can't bear fruit again. Every attitude anyone displays, that's what they are attacking. They are attacking your fruit bearing. This is your life. You have an assignment to bear fruit. All the attacks you're going to face is to from fulfilling that one assignment. Everything God that is that's the first thing he said, be fruitful. Every other thing God said afterwards is connected to being fruitful. Rule over the animals. We are afraid of animals today. You know why we are afraid of animals today? Because we don't believe in the love. It's the truth. We don't believe in the love. You know, they, they, they tell us that even lion, when you meet a lion, what the lion perceives 
from you that makes it attack you is actually fear. The lion fears you will attack it. Because the lion can smell your adrenaline. When fear begins to rise in your heart, the lion is perceiving it. And when the, what the lion is actually perceiving is you will be provoked to attack. So let me attack first. Do you understand what I'm saying? But in this same world, men have tamed lions. There are people that have lions as pets. Why is the lion not attacking them? Because the lion sees love. That's all. The lion sees love. The same thing. With, now you can have, people have had dogs that they have kept in their homes and then one day the dog woke up and did something terrible. You've heard stories like that. What do you think happened? You know, we only hear the side of the human, but we don't hear the side of the dog. <laughs> you, know what I'm saying? You, you don't know what made that dog to change its mind. It was fear. So in fear, even the animal had to act to survive. So it attacks. But what happened? The breakdown of love. So the reason we are not even subduing animals, <laughs> we are not having dominion over animals, is because we are not doing the first thing. We are not what? Fruits. Number one assignment. This is the assignment God has given to us. How well are you fulfilling that assignment? And you see, now we multiply, we raise up children. And we are even bold enough these days to tell our children, look, I am not God. I cannot give you everything. And we think we are being human. <laughs> I don't know if you understand. But actually, we are confessing failure. It's a confession of failure. Why can't we give them everything? Because we are not receiving everything. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. We are not receiving everything. And why are we not receiving everything? Not because God is not giving everything. But our minds are twisted. By the things we have been hearing and receiving. And everything we hear and receive is things that tell us that the love of God is not complete in us. Everything from provision, everything. But that's not the world that God planned. God planned a world that was full of love. Full of love. Anything that attacks your love should only have a response that proves that love is real. Everything that attacks your love, the response it's supposed to get is that your love is real. That's why it's everyone's it's true scriptures Everyone that walks with God, this is one thing that their life proves. That God is love. And when you come to understand that, you realize one thing about your life. You become meek. And one of the full, des one of the full display of love is meekness. Everyone who walked with God, really walked with God. Not There's a difference between one who God is using and one who's walking with God. There's a big difference. Any man who walks with God, to walk with God means to learn his ways. Learn of him, understand him. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and do what? Learn of me. Learn from me. What do you learn from him? 
That's why when you, when you follow the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus was simply manifesting one thing, love. Everything Jesus taught is love. When Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on this side, turn the other side for him to slap. He didn't he know that you two have hand to slap? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But he's trying to tell you that that slap means nothing. Do you understand? You are actually, the, the person slapped you to prove or to force or to say to you that your love is not complete. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Why would you refrain from slapping? Because you figure that that slap was just something you can do like this. You figure that you are greater than that person that slapped you. It's like a child coming to hit your leg. Imagine if someone standing there and a child comes and is hitting the person's leg. And that's the person, the person that moves and gives the child a hot slap. I say, why did you do that? Didn't you say I was hitting my leg? Oh, you said the Abba. Did he do anything to your leg? <laughs> do you understand? So, why do we respond the way we respond? Because we see ourselves lower. So, you will say to that person, this is a child. Did you see that it was just a child? But truly, what happened is the person brought himself lower than he is. That that's what we do all the time. <coughs> I have the right to respond. You have the right to respond. You respond. But your response is proving one thing. Fear. That's what your response is proving. That is fear in your heart. Because you're thinking, if I don't respond, they will think I'm weak. Why are you afraid that they will think you're weak? Are you weak? <laughs> I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. Are you weak? It's like somebody standing and say, God! You don't exist. You think God's going to come out and say, "Eh, hey. you say I don't exist. Watch out." <laughs> you think God's going to respond to that? He will not respond. He won't. But a day will come when that same person will look up and say, "God, please, if you can save me." <laughs> God will not appear to him. More. God will not do anything. Only him, as he's growing, as he's moving in life, one day. He will come to that point where he will realize that he was wrong and God did it, did it take God to respond to him immediately to prove that because why would God respond he knows who he is you that is shouting one day cancer is coming <laughs> do you understand it's, you're shouting there is no God there's no God is no see, see cancer is coming keep quiet it's not like he will send the cancer do you understand what I'm saying? You see, as you're moving, you see, he's in front. <laughs> when you get there, then they tell you that it's only God that will save you. <laughs> when you think in your heart, before I give up, let me just, if there is God, <laughs> then you have to tell yourself that if it's not if there is God, there has to be God. <laughs> because I need him to save me now. Only that person that opened his mouth to say there is no, only him who reverse his statement. And that's how much God, how much big or how big God is. So when you say, if I don't, if I keep quiet, they'll think I'm a fool. It's because you too, you think in your heart that you're a fool. You think it. Because if you're not, or if you don't think it, you tell yourself, like, hi. This guy doesn't know who he just slapped. He will find out. <laughs> he will find out. I mean, that's enough. He will find out. And this is how you're supposed to relate with every issue of life. Because you're relating with it from the place of love. This is who you are. It's a command from God. And God commanded because he has put in you the capacity. He will not tell you to do what you cannot do. He, he commanded you to bear fruit. Now, fruit is not, you don't bear fruit from outside. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? When it's time for the orange tree to bear fruit, we don't go and look for orange fruits and tie <laughs> on the orange. The fruit is inside. As it's growing and growing and growing, it gets to a point it releases flowers. Nobody goes to hang flowers on it. It releases flowers. Then from releasing the flower, next thing you start seeing some tiny seeds. It's from the inside, it releases it. And after releasing it, then the next thing, that tiny seed is now growing and becoming something round. It came from the inside. So even the day you planted that thing is on the ground, it has the ability to bear fruit. It will survive the first day. It will survive the first week. It will survive the first month. The weather may be harsh. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it is still pushing through. It is still pushing through and pushing through. Then it gets to the point. It's time to bear fruit. It begins to bear the fruit. It all came from the inside. So he knows that a day will come where man will require my fruit. On that day I will produce fruit for him. So that time, that season comes. And the same natural process. Nothing special has to be done to the tree. The same natural process, the fruit begins to come. And everyone comes around it and begins to plug and eat and be happy and be satisfied. It's the same thing. That's, see, God, that's how God created us to be. When he says be fruitful, everything in life will come to look for fruit from you. Everything in life will come searching for fruit from you. Hear me? That's the bargaining power God gave to you to subdue the earth. Your love. Your love. But the place where we have failed the most is here. That's where we have failed the most. And because we have failed the most, we don't teach our children. We don't show them. We don't teach them. Most times, even as men, you're too stressed out. So you won't have time to display. We don't consider it. Those of us that have children, you don't consider it that, hey, the reason these children came into this world is to learn from me, as I have learned from God. You know, I realized something. Enoch walked with God. And Enoch gave back to Methuselah. Methuselah walked with God too. He was, in fact, he was the one. Everything Enoch wrote, he handed it over to Methuselah. And before Enoch left, he called all his children together and gave them proper instruction about his work with God, and told them how to serve God, how to live before God. Now. The generation continued to Lamech, to Noah. They had, Noah had other brothers. But not all of them followed the pattern that their grandfather Enoch transferred to them. But Noah received it and walked. Noah gave birth to three sons. Shem, Japhet and Ham. But it was Shem that continued in the way of his father. And you will hear Shem refer to Enoch. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The lineage continued to Abraham. Abraham was a righteous man because of Shem. Are you listening? 
Because Abraham would go visit Shem and would be instructed. Isaac, the same thing. Jacob, the same thing. That is the instruction they kept following. Something that was passed down. Are you getting what I'm saying? Something that was passed down. And they will keep referring to just like our grandfather taught us. But you see, Jacob still followed the pattern of his father. His grandfather. Got to his children. Joseph. The same thing. Joseph was the one that was always spending time with his father. So you see these people, what were they carrying is virtue. The fathers were transferring virtue to the children. The children were receiving virtue to the fathers. These are the things that we are not too concerned about in our lives today. All we think about today, let our children go to the best schools, you know, come out, graduate, and become something. It's not about becoming something. It's not about becoming something. You see the funny thing about life? Even while Abraham and the rest of them were particular about doing things God's way, there were people that were prospering. Canaan was a bustling place. There were rich people. Do you understand what I'm saying? People were doing well. Even then, even then in Abraham's days, God has already started telling them that leave all those people alone. All these things that they are acquiring, it will be a waste. Follow the pattern of God. How many were they on the earth there? <laughs> How many were they on the earth there? But what I'm pointing out to you is these men were transferring virtues. There was a pattern that they were transferring to their children. Today, you see men who have walked with God so much. But all they are concerned about is now we have money. Let's send our children to the best schools. And then their children come out from the best schools. Next day they are thinking of, oh, I have connections. Let me talk to this person to fix my children in important places. We're not sitting down, sitting our children down and teaching them virtues, teaching them love. That is what God will require of them. So you see, we are failing in bearing fruit. I get what I'm saying. We're failing in bearing fruit. We are multiplying, but multiplying the wrong thing. Multiplying without fruit. So each generation... It's, it's reducing. Each generation is reducing. Each generation is reducing. So we need to repent first before the Lord concerning this. As men, your wife must never complain of lack of love. It's not just, I love you, I love you. It must be seen, felt, understood. And it has nothing to do with what she does. It's something you owe God as a virtue. You receive from him, you give it. Your children must never grow up wondering what love is. It's something you make. See, why am I teaching these things? If you don't know, you will not reason it. And if you don't reason it, you will not pray about it. And if you don't pray about it, Satan will just continue to have his way. Have his way. The family is being broken. It's being broken. I don't look at yourself today that, oh, no, I'm trying to keep my family together. What are the fabrics that you're using to hold it? Can it survive the next generation? 
if you don't know what is holding your family together, if you don't know what is holding it, you might lose that family by the next generation. Because whatever is holding your family together must hold your children too. So when they grow and they start their own family, they understand what is what we are working with. So you find Jacob calling his son, um, uh, Isaac calling his son and telling him, look, you remember you have been told, don't marry any girl from this area. Go to Laban's house. Go and marry of his daughters. And Jacob said, yes, sir. And he went. He went because he understood. He didn't say, ah, nah, nah, wow, go all that far. As he left to go and branch. <laughs> he obeyed. He understood. How many of us did our parents cancel us concerning marriage? You know what I mean by that? I say, look, my son, this is how you should marry. How many? You get what I'm saying? But you see, when you study scriptures, you realize that there, there was a pattern. There was a proper guidance. And that's what preserved their lives. And it just happens that, of course, as the generation was increasing, it was getting slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. But God too was defending in every generation. He was defending because Abraham, for example, his heart was in it. So, you see, Abraham was careful to instruct his son, Isaac, and Jacob. I can't remember if, if Jacob grew up. I can't remember that part. But he was able to instruct Isaac. And Isaac, that this is where the wife came in. Because Rebecca stood to defend Jacob. <laughs> I get what I'm saying. What was she defending? Is the vision she was defending. Left for Isaac, he would have toyed with it. But Rebecca defended that vision. Say, no, we cannot cut off. Hey, 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 your brother has made a mistake already. You cannot try it. Carry yourself. Go and marry from Susan Zopis. What was she thinking about? The defense of the next generation. People don't understand this. Thing. People think, ah, what is there? What is there? Ah, give, me, give me Malachi. Give me Malachi chapter 2. You know, sometimes we don't know what the thing God is after. We think we're just here living make money, do this, do that. You don't know what God is after. Malachi chapter 2, from verse 14. Give me, okay. Mm. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Next verse. But he did, but did he, watch this now. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. God is seeking godly offspring. He says, therefore, take heed to your spirits and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his Youth. Now, is it, hold on there. We'll go to the next verse in a moment. Now, you see how God is speaking. He said, look, I'm angry with you because you have dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. Then he says, is it not God that made them, the two, to become one? Why did he do it? There's something he's looking for. He's looking for godly offspring. Now, what will produce godly offspring? Fruitfulness. Are you listening to me? 
It is those who bear fruit that will produce godly offspring. Now take note, godly offspring is not just by birth. Are you getting what I'm saying? You have to give birth first. If you give birth and you don't raise up, that thing that was godly will turn to something else. And by the next generation, you may lose that godly seed. By the next generation, you may lose it. But God is seeking for godly offspring. Now, he's not just seeking for godly offspring from us. I get what I'm saying. This is what he's going to be seeking till eternity. Every, <laughs> every generation is looking for the next generation. And what he's looking for is godly offspring. So he's looking for those who will produce godly offspring. Now, he is vexing for someone for not treating his wife well. I get what I'm saying. And then he brought up this purpose that you have a purpose. And what's that purpose? Fruitfulness. Next verse. He said, let none deal with treasures. For God, watch, now look at this. For the Lord God of Israel says that he what? Hates divorce. You know why? Most times we say God hates divorce. We don't say why. Why? For it covers one's garment with violence. That's why he hates it. Which translation now? Okay, see, he says, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. There's a translation that says, give me Amplify, let me see. There's something, there's a word I'm looking for. Let me, let me check the easy Bible. Huh? Read it, let me hear. That's the word. That's the word. Do you see that? Why does God hate divorce? Because before you get to that point of divorce, there is some measure of cruelty that would have come out of you. And that itself affects your number one assignment to bear fruit. So before a man gets to the process of divorce, you must get to, you must pass through that channel of cruelty. And the act of cruelty is actually a testimony that there is no love in you. Do you understand? Do you understand? So when God says he hates divorce, it's you he's looking at. You met this girl. Oh, I will love you for the rest of my life. You guys danced together. You were toasting her. You were going. She was saying no. You did everything. I love you. I love you. I love you. Okay. Now you're married. I'm there. Yeah, things are just dry. Nothing is happening. And then you get to that point where it's like, I don't think we can live together again. You think she's the problem. You don't realize that you have lost your ministry. You've lost it. When you told her you would take care of her, when you told her you would love her, you meant it to. But now the challenges of life, some of it even from her directly, has come to prove that you are empty. See, when the Bible says, husband, love your wife, as what? Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for, he think it's a joke. You know, people, the Lord said something to me. Yes, that was yesterday. I was meditating on this meeting. During the, one of the times, I was just resting. And I was just like, oh Lord, this meeting. So the Lord said something to me. He said, every man must see their spouse, their wives, as a 
test to bring out the love that is in him. So anything your wife does is a challenge. So the first, when God puts a wife in your life, you know what he's actually doing? He's not just saying, so you buy flowers and yeah, love you, love you, love you, love you. He is putting somebody who is going to provoke you to produce the love that he wants you to produce. So your exam is before you. Your examination is before you. So when she complains, it's not for you to query her. I say, what is it? Am I not trying? Re-examine yourself. It's time to bear fruit. It's time to prove that there is fruit in me. See, the easy way is easy, of course. <laughs> you understand? The easy way. You know, like men. You know, when you too much, you shout. Like, what is it? Yeah? <laughs> Am I not your husband? See that woman. God is watching. When God wants to prove, he wants to pull fruit from you, he tunes her. If every man will understand this, you will prosper so easily. So easily. I'll give you an example. Okay. Let's say you and your wife have a joint account, money account, right? And out of, I mean, no, I mean, the ATM card is with her, you, you do transfers, you know, like everything. And then so she goes to the market and she sees something that she feels is good. And maybe she couldn't reach you. And she goes ahead and clears the account and buys that thing that she feels is good. <laughs> now, in your mind, we have this money and you know how we, we men, we reason. We think, I always tell my wife, I say, you, you think of what you're seeing now. But me, I'm thinking of school fees. <laughs> I'm already programming my mind how, okay, this thing is there, this thing is there, this thing is there. Not worrying. You understand what I'm saying? But you just, bang, bang, bang. So when you see money, you, you're telling yourself, okay, we still have like 200K here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then you just receive a lot. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> what happened? No, I saw this thing. You know, I've been looking for this thing. I've been looking, when I saw it, I just said, ah, this is my only opportunity. I better get it. And he said, you collect the money. And he said, eh, God will provide now. <laughs> You say what? <laughs> you better go and pray God to provide now. now. <laughs> but you see that statement, that little statement is challenging the love. It's challenging you to bear fruit. But what do you do? You blame her. You say you're insensitive. Why didn't you? I said, I called you now. You didn't pick your call. Eh, eh, did you know I was in a meeting? He said, I had to make a decision then, then, then. Don't tell me that. <laughs> you keep arguing, arguing, arguing. And you carry that. Next thing you're thinking, look, I, I, I'm, I'm, see, that joint guy is not house money. I only put the money. <laughs> see, you're, you've taken a decision with fear. You're building up. You have cut off love. You have taken a decision that had no love inside. And you think you're being smart. But what you don't realize is that God has come to demand fruit from you. He did not find. What was I supposed to do? Be calm. Father, <laughs> the woman you gave me, she has finished the money. 
<laughs> Can we have more supplies, please? Why can't you respond like that? Because you don't see love. You know what you see? I know how I got that money. <laughs> That's all you see. I know how I got that money. And now just one sweep, you finished it. And so you're programming your mind, I have to wait for another month. When pay comes. That's what you're thinking. But God is looking at you like, look, I'm tired of you being on this level. I want to change. So let that money go away. That even that one is a seed. <laughs> now your wife went to Claire. You don't... Meanwhile, God is watching you at that moment. He's watching you. You now take a decision. You can spend it. But, and God shakes his head. You miss an opportunity to, to increase. Even worse, still make a decision. And you see, the moment you make a decision based on something like that, you just cut off a supply. You just, you just put a barricade in your life. That's what you just did. Every decision you take, you know, the way you grow or fall in life is by your decisions. So if you make a decision that is based on falsehood, you just put a barricade in your life that even God cannot penetrate. That's what you just did to your life. Meanwhile, you could, you could have expanded your frontier by that situation. You could have expanded your frontier. But rather, you put a barricade. God is demanding fruits. That's why he came. he came to demand fruit. So when he says he was a witness, <laughs> do you understand? So because he witnessed the way you were treating her. He didn't say what she did though. He didn't say what she did. But he said he saw how you were treating her. You said you were going to love her. Okay, this said, he said, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. I hate it when one of you does such a cruel thing to his wife. Make sure that you do not break your promise to be faithful to your wife. I think it's still that easy. Read it again. Remember, remember your promise to take care of her. See, let me tell you one secret. If you cannot conquer your house, if you cannot conquer your wife, I'm sorry, you cannot conquer the world. Any progress you think you are making, Apart from that, dominion in your house is false. And it will crash one day. You made a promise to this woman. You can't keep it. Now that's the one that God is watching every day. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You're not keeping it. Why not keeping it? You start mentioning all the challenges. And you're a successful businessman. You're not really successful. Satan has not come for you yet. One day he will come. Maybe he looks at you and says, no, it has not, it's not ripe yet. <laughs> it's not ripe yet. I, I want it when I hit him. The fall will be so great that it will affect 10,000 people. So leave him. Your head is broken, no? You don't know. You're doing well in business. Your family, see that your house is the gift that God has given to you. It's the garden that God has given to you. And every expansion, 
every blessing you are going to exhibit in this life, every goodness you are going to exhibit in this life must find its roots in that your garden. You're the one to defend that garden. And how do you defend that garden? Not by doing command and control. I said sit down. Fill that environment with fruitfulness. Fill that environment with fruitfulness. Your children go anywhere. People will say, Kai, these children, your parents love you. They don't have to say it. It's beaming from them. Your wife steps out anywhere without anybody knowing who she's married to. It's just like, hi, Suman. They can see. They can see that there is love around her. They sense it. But it's not by mind. It's not by power. Time is almost up. It's not by mind. It's not by power. It's not something you should struggle to do. It's something you should learn how to yield to God. Because that's where the fruit will bear fruit from. Are you getting what I'm saying? We yield to him. He is inside us. The spirit of God is inside us. So before I get angry, before I take any action, before I take any rash decision, no matter how the provocation came about, I want to first of all go inside. Go inside. And search for the fruit. I search and I produce it. I search and I produce it. Listen to me. We owe this world one thing. To show them who God is. That's what we owe the world. Everything is so bastardized. Everything is so bastardized. Everything. See, the devil is ruling because men are not taking their place. Men are not bearing fruit. So much so that women are now beginning to think that maybe we should step. (laughs) But you see, they did not receive such instructions from God. They didn't. That's why Paul says, wives do what? Submit to your husband. What are they submitting to? Love. They are submitting to love. So they are Their life is made to submit to love. So when a woman starts acting like she is in charge, when a woman starts acting like she is the one to give love, guess what is going to happen to the man? The woman will definitely submit to a higher power from the man. She will submit. As she's rising, she will get to a point are you get what I'm saying? She will get to a point where she submits. We have a duty. We have a role. This is the beginning. But this is a good starting point. The first assignment God has given to us. That's the assignment we should be conscious about. Can we pray? I leave you to pray to the Lord yourself. When you hear messages like this, you may need to repent. You may need to talk to the Lord. Heart to heart, I have failed. I have failed. We learn every day. Some things I'm sharing with you today. The Lord spoke to me about them this morning. So I had to go through my own repentance too. I said, Kai, Lord. I thought I was a good guy. <laughs> I, I missed it here. Bearing fruit. We have a duty to the world to bear fruit. Father, you're bringing us this understanding now. Because indeed you're repairing things on the earth. Lord, we are hearing you now. We thank you, Lord, for counting us 
worthy to be instructed like this. And Lord, we yield. We yield to your plans. We yield to your purpose. Fruitfulness, Lord, you will find in us. I pray that every time you seek fruit from us, you will find. Now we understand. We understand. We will be conscious. Holy Spirit, you are a helper. You are a helper. We ask that you help us. At any time the Father is coming to demand fruit, please remind us that it's fruit time.